Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar of putting research into action here with Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. My name is Robert Bush, and I am pleased to um, be the moderator of this webinar today with our guest presenter, Dr. Ty Brumbach from the University of California, San Diego. And we're going to be talking today about uh, a recent chapter that Dr. Brumbach and his colleagues um, have, have recently uh, published about the neurological effects of marijuana use, specifically using neuroimaging and specifically on the developing brain. So Dr. Brumbach, how are you doing today? Great, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, it's our pleasure. And I know that this is a, a topic that, as I mentioned to you briefly before, that our community coalitions are very interested in learning more about. This is the fifth uh, in our webinar series of, of putting research into action in which we take a recently published scholarly article or journal or chapter and put that out into the public to, to try and be a bridge between the work that medical professionals and university professors and others are doing and to put that in a way that community volunteers, community staff members can can day to day in, can use that in a, in a day to day way. And so we're very happy to um, be doing work today with marijuana, which is a, a very topic that's been of, of much interest. Um, we know, for example, that in we were told last year that just un, under 40% of American high school seniors now reported that they believe it's risky using marijuana regularly. We know that over 4 million Americans experience a marijuana disorder every year. And when we ask our coalition members what they would like to learn about in these webinars, the number one response is marijuana and especially how it's affecting our young people right now. And that's why when I came across this chapter, it is um, particularly poignant. Uh, the name of this chapter being The Effects of Marijuana Use on Brain Structure and Function, Neuroimaging Findings from a Neurodevelopmental Perspective. So going forward here, um, let's go ahead and give you a, a brief uh, introduction to the presenters here. Um, again, my name is Robert Bush on the right. I'm part of the National Coalition Institute here at CADCA on the evaluation and research team. And on the left here, we have our guest today, Dr. Ty Brumbach from the University of California, San Diego, working at the VA healthcare system there. And so Dr. Brumbach, I will turn it over to you right now and let you introduce uh, yourself and the rest of your team. Great, thank you. Uh, and again, I wanna thank uh, uh, Robert for inviting me and, and CADCA. Uh, as a researcher, one of our, um, our uh, pleasures is to be able to talk to people at the front lines and people who are interested in uh, what we're doing in a very practical way. And I think sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect there. Uh, so what I really hope to do today is tell you a little bit about uh, my research and, and talk about how it might be uh, informative for how uh, we can um, both prevent and treat uh, substance use uh, and particularly marijuana use. Um, so as you see here, I, I, uh, my two collaborators on this uh, are um, Dr. Susan Tapert and Dr. Joanna Jacobus. Uh, Dr. Susan Tapert is uh, the senior uh, researcher on, on um, most of the work that I've been doing. Uh, she's been uh, one of the key uh, researchers uh, nationally and, and worldwide, frankly, uh, looking at um, the effects of substance use on neurodevelopment in adolescents and young adults. Um, and so uh, a lot of the data that uh, I um, use are from her long-term studies where she's able to follow uh, kids and adolescents uh, through young adulthood and, and do both neuroimaging and uh, neurocognitive testing to see how um, their brains are functioning as well. Uh, Joanna Jacobus as well has been um, a, a tremendous collaborator 
uh, particularly in the area of marijuana use, so it's one of her key interests as well. Um, and so what, uh, what Robert referred to is the chapter that we've just put out that is really a review of a lot of findings, not only from our lab, but from others uh, around the country. And we really try to summarize a lot of those data uh, to, to um, uh, kind of show where the field is currently. And as you all know, uh, it's, it's a hot topic uh, both in research and in, in communities because uh, of a lot of the uh, discussion around uh, changing uh, legal status uh, and just, frankly, the prevalence of marijuana uh, across the country. Um, Excellent. So I think we'll, I'll go ahead and get into the presentation now. Um, and there are two main goals of what I want to present today. Um, and so, uh, oh, Ty, excuse me, if I could interrupt you for a minute. Sure. Okay. I also just want to, I forgot to mention, um, for those that are, are watching and listening, at the end of uh, Dr. Brumbach's presentation, uh, I'm going to give everyone the chance to ask some questions for him to answer. And so feel free to submit your questions uh, right now th throughout the, his presentation via, via email. You can email myself, my ad email address, many of you have it through this invitation. Um, but again, it is R Bush. That's R B U S C H at at CADCA dot org. R Bush at CADCA dot org, and I'll be happy to take some of those questions at the end. So, thank you. Great, thank you. And so there are two primary goals of this presentation today um, and, and two research questions that I kind of want to address. Uh, and the first is just uh, uh, some basic information on how prevalent is marijuana use. So uh, we hear a lot about it uh, in the news and in different um, media outlets, uh, particularly when the different, uh, it, it seems like each uh, election cycle another uh, state has some referendum on their ballots uh, about marijuana. Um, so I just want to present a little bit of data about marijuana use. Um, and about, uh, uh, about the content of marijuana because it's going to be very important for uh, the second question, which is how does marijuana use affect brain development and function? Um, and so for the research that I do, it's really focused on adolescent development and, and the way uh, substances may change uh, adolescent brain development. And so I'm going to take a, a, a developmental perspective on this. Uh, all right, so we can go ahead into the first slide, Robert. That, um, I'm not sure if it's up there yet, but uh, it, it will catch up here if, if not. Uh, so one of the um, uh, most recent epidemiological studies that uh, takes a nationwide look at substance use has shown that recently um, one in three young adults, and that's age 18 to 28, report that they use marijuana or they have used marijuana in the last 12 months. Um, so this, this rate is, is really quite high. Um, uh, historically, uh, the, the peaks in marijuana use were in the late 70s and early 80s, and then there was a, a low point in the early 90s where marijuana rates had really decreased. But really, since the early to mid 90s, the rates have been increasing slightly over time uh, to the point where now we're about one out of three. Um, what we know from from uh, research is that roughly nine percent of users, or one in eleven. Uh, marijuana users end up developing uh, marijuana dependence or dependence on uh, THC specifically, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and it's the second highest reason for substance use treatment uh, behind alcohol. And so uh, just the cost on uh, the medical costs and the cost in society are quite high uh, because of uh, marijuana use. And so um, what I uh, want to focus on too is this, this age range 18 to 28 because this is really where the peak of marijuana use tends to occur. Um, and what we've seen over time is that um, younger kids uh, start using uh, marijuana as well. And so, um, and Robert, I'm sure, is everyone seeing the, the next slide? Yes. The, the, right. right now we're on the background slide. Do you want to move forward? Uh, so I guess I'm just not seeing it on my screen. So uh, yeah, so if, if we could go to slide six now, that would be great. Okay, we're on there now. Okay, great. Uh, 
great. So um, what I'm showing here is a, a, it's just a map of um, marijuana use uh, in a younger age group. So this is 12 to 17. And so what I want you to take away from this uh, is that uh, the use rates vary widely by state and even by region within state. But here you can see that uh, states that have uh, change their laws or the legal status of marijuana do see higher rates of adolescent marijuana use. So all the, all the states who have changed uh, marijuana laws, whether it's medical marijuana or decriminalizing marijuana, um, of course you still have to be above 18 in these states and yet we see that there's a very clear um, uh, increase in the rates of use among adolescents, so uh, this 12 to 18 age range. Uh, importantly, while these prevalence rates have, have gone up over the last decade, uh, perceived risk from marijuana use has gone down, and, and Robert mentioned this at the beginning. Um, and, and right now, with uh, among this age group, 12 to 17, only 30% of them uh, perceive a, a great risk of harm from monthly marijuana use. Um, and so this is a really key concept because the perceived risk of marijuana use is a harbinger of, of future use rates. And we've seen that over time over the uh, last few decades of research that, is, that have um, uh, asked both for perceived risk and uh, use rate. Um, and another important thing, uh, concept to understand is that marijuana itself has been changing rapidly over the last two decades. Um, so as uh, I mentioned this previously, but as many of you probably know, uh, the, the chemical in marijuana that is psychoactive though, that leads to a high is uh, delta-9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's THC uh, for, uh, for our purposes. And so uh, in marijuana, the levels of THC have been increasing over time. And so in marijuana, it's a very complex uh, plant with lots of chemicals in them, uh, in, in marijuana. And so there are over 70 uh, what we call cannabinoids or chemicals that, um, that may affect the brain in marijuana. Um, and THC is the one that's, that, that's uh, associated with the, the feeling of high. Um, <coughs> um, and with innovations in, in uh, um, breeding and growing marijuana plants, people have really focused on increasing the level of THC uh, in these plants. And so if we can go to slide seven now. Okay, we're on slide seven. Um, what, what this slide depicts uh, on the left side uh, is just the percentage of, um, uh, it describes the, the percentage of each of these categories that are, uh, that are found. And then the black line with the white dots is the average THC percentage in, in marijuana. And so these are data from uh, a national laboratory um, that's really focused on uh, analyzing seized marijuana. So whenever the national or the federal government seizes marijuana, they analyze those to get data on on uh, what are the contents of these marijuana samples. And what you can see is in the the mid 90s when when we started collecting data on these things, most of the THC levels uh, were in the three to seven percent THC range. Uh, but over time, as as breeding has changed and as uh, as uh, marijuana producers have really focused on it adding uh, more potent uh, strains, you see that in the last few years, the majority of our of the marijuana that's seized or that's available in the U.S. Uh, is in the higher uh, or high potency range. And what this means is that the people who are using marijuana are getting much higher exposure uh, to THC um, and, and in a way that um, we need to find out, and this is part of what I'll talk about uh, at the second half of, of the presentation, uh, we need to find out what, what differences uh, the level of THC might mean uh, for, for brain development. And another uh, important thing to point out, too, is that, as I mentioned, uh, THC is one of only 70 uh, plus uh, cannabinoids or, or active substance, substances in marijuana. And um, this increase in THC has come at a cost to some of these other substances. And so one of these uh, cannabinoids is called cannabidiol um, or CBD. And so uh, there's been some research on CBD that shows that it's actually um, uh, potentially protective
protective of brain systems. Um, and uh, so some of the medical uses of marijuana seem to really focus on CBD. Well, if, if, uh, we'll go to the next slide, slide eight. And what you'll see on slide eight is actually uh, as the THC levels in marijuana plants uh, as by breeding and, and other uh, production ways, uh, the level of CBD has decreased. And so uh, by, uh, and this slide um, depicts a ratio of THC to CBD. And you can see in the last, uh, especially the last decade, uh, the THC to CBD ratio has, uh, has increased exponentially. Um, and so what, uh, what people are consuming now on in average uh, is uh, much higher levels of THC relative to CBD. We, um, and again, I'll refer back to this in a few minutes. Um, but what is unclear is whether this increased ratio puts people at greater risk. Uh, because we know from some early studies, again, that CBD may have some beneficial effects, uh, but because of consumer demand in a lot of ways, people really want more THC. They want the, the, the high producing uh, chemical and the people who are producing marijuana are meeting that demand uh, in a way that may be putting people at even greater risk uh, than previous uh, decades. So we'll go on to the next slide. We'll transition here a little bit to brain development now. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, just general uh, concepts related to brain development and then get into the effects that marijuana has on brain development. So during adolescence, uh, brain development is quite rapid uh, and it continues to, to develop into young adulthood. Um, and and uh, we all are aware of this, um, but the, the important thing to think about here as we consider the effect of substances on, on uh, brains is that it's not just uh, the acute effect of marijuana on, uh, on brain function, but what we're really talking about is the potential for marijuana or other substances to change developmental trajectories. Um, so to change the way the brain develops. Um, and when substances are entered into uh, the brain or the body system in this critical developmental window, uh, it, it um, could upset the entire um, developmental trajectory. So that's what we'll talk about uh, as we go forward. So if we could go to slide 10, I've got a, a picture of a, a of a developing brain there. And Robert, this actually has an, in, uh, an embedded video. Um, I'm not sure if it will um, play, but if it's possible to play it, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I can play uh, it. If not, I'll just describe it. I can play it. OK, great. Let me just uh, wait for it to pull up. Sure. at the bottom, and then the frontal lobes, which are uh, the, the large uh, frontal region there of the brain. Um, and so what happens with uh, 
over time, all the way um, until the early 20s, and some some research even shows that the brain continues to develop to develop out until age 27 or so. Um, and so this is. Uh, important to keep in mind that even though you know we, we consider uh, adulthood uh, legally to start at age 18, uh, in many ways um, brains of, of young adults are still maturing and are still developing um, and still in that way at risk for, uh, for having some potentially uh, damaging effects or some changes to the brain uh, trajectories over time. And so if we could go on to slide 11 a little bit about um, why understanding marijuana's effects on the brain uh, during this key developmental window uh, is going to be really important. Um, and so uh, the brain develops in a number of ways, uh, both uh, structural changes, so changes in uh, the number of brain cells and the number of brain connections, but also in functional ways. It's the way the brain communicates uh, with, with uh, other areas of the brain. And so um, understanding marijuana's effects has to uh, uh, focus on both of these uh, brain developmental um, trajectories, both the structural changes and the functional changes over time. And so we can go on to slide 12. Okay. So there are a couple methodologies that we use in our research group specifically. Uh, and the primary um, brain imaging that we use is magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And many of you have probably heard of this. Um, I've got a few pictures at the bottom there that, that just show kind of what we're able to see uh, in, these, in, uh, in this imaging technique. And what we're able to look at with MRI is both the structural, um, and, and in here I have gray matter and white matter. So gray matter is brain cells, and then white matter is uh, essentially the areas of the brain that are connections. Uh, so there's a, a, uh, a lipid sheath that, occur, uh, that grows around um, connections in the brain, and that provides more efficient connections. And so they show up as white matter uh, because of the fat content. And whereas gray matter are really the, the brain cells themselves. Um, and so we're able to look at both gray, gray matter and white matter. And then we're able to look at functional changes. And so in functional MRI, uh, this is the, the picture depicted at the bottom on the left where there's some uh, colored overlays on the brain. And what we can see here is, is the way the brain reacts to different uh, conditions or stimuli that we show. Uh, or in, uh, uh, So this could be pictures or uh, different tasks. So in, in uh, a few minutes, I'll talk about some of the tasks that we have people to do, but we have people um, go into the scanner, which is a, a large uh, magnet if anybody has uh, had an MRI before, but it, it's uh, you get um, put into a, the bore of this magnet, so it's a small space where people are loaded in, and then we uh, have them uh, complete different tasks while they're in, uh, in the scanner. We're able to see how their brains react to the different tasks, and so we might ask them to do some um, thought puzzles. Uh, or do some memory tasks or this kind of thing. And we're able to look at how the brains function in different ways. And then we also do some testing outside of the scanner, uh, neuropsychological testing, where we will ask um, people to complete uh, uh, mental arithmetic, memorize lists of words, uh, maybe uh, try to respond quickly to different types of, of uh, pictures, uh, or um, doing some puzzles like spatial reasoning tasks. And so these are all tasks that we complete. Um, some of them we do in the scanner, and, and many of them we also do outside the scanner to see how um, typically developing uh, adolescents and young adults are able to uh, uh, respond on these different tasks. Go on to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've found so far uh, with uh, marijuana use in the brain. And so the first is that marijuana use is associated with a uh, smaller hippocampus. And so the hippocampus is an area of the brain uh, that's very important for memory, uh, memory functioning, and the formation of new memories. And so uh, it's been a robust effect that's been found both in our lab and across other labs as well that the more people use marijuana, the smaller uh, their hippocampi will be. And so they, 
uh, it seems to be a, a pretty uh, strong effect. Uh, and it's, um, what we found is that it, it is directly related to the level of use. So there's been some studies that have shown that the more people use, the smaller their hippocampus might be. Uh, and so uh, I'll talk about in a few minutes <coughs> uh, some of the, the future projects that we have to kind of define a little more specifically. Um, but, but this does seem to be at least one of the, the most robust effects. And in addition, uh, what we found is that marijuana use tends to delay the maturation uh, of the prefrontal cortex. So on that brain picture that I showed a few minutes ago, the front section or the section that was on the, the left there, that picture is the prefrontal cortex. Um, and this is uh, a region of the brain that's associated with a higher cognitive function, so decision making um, and executive control or the ability to control cognitive functioning. Um, and it's one of the later uh, regions to develop uh, regardless, but with marijuana use, we found that uh, these regions are delayed in the development even further. And so what we see is uh, a typically developing uh, brain will, uh, the um, prefrontal cortex will thin out and that shows a, a maturing of the, of the cortex. Um, it's becoming more efficient and it's getting rid of unnecessary uh, uh, brain cells or connections to make things more efficient. Um, and what we uh, have found is that individuals who use marijuana, uh, their brains tend to look like people that are a few years younger than, than them chronologically. Um, and in addition with this, we found that earlier onset of marijuana use leads to a stronger effect. And so this goes back to some of the things I mentioned before that we're really interested in trajectories or how the the development over time changes. Uh, it's not just a, a sort of turning on or turning off, but potentially changing uh, the, the developmental trajectory so that there might be different endpoints. And so this is one of the, the key concepts and, and uh, frankly one of the key concerns we have when we're looking at the effects of marijuana use on, on brain development. And then one of the, the third uh, brain structure effects that we found is that there are less efficient or mature connections. And so before I mentioned that white matter um, in the brain reflects uh, uh, the, these connections. And uh, so it's uh, more white matter uh, tends to equal more efficient connections. Um, and because these uh, brain connections are then uh, uh, more um, instantiated so they're stronger. And so what we found with marijuana use is that the white matter uh, tends to be a little less well developed. And so uh, over time in a typically developing brain, white matter becomes uh, uh, stronger uh, and more robust. And what we find with marijuana users is that they tend to show a little bit less of that. So there's less efficient and potentially less mature connections. So we can go on to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have found um, with marijuana and brain function. Um, so uh, marijuana use tends to decrease uh, a young adults' ability uh, on a couple of different types of tasks. So one is a verbal memory task. So this is kind of what I mentioned before, but uh, being able to memorize lists of words and to recall them at a later time. Uh, also, it tends to decrease processing speed, so that's the ability uh, to respond quickly and to take in information, uh, process it, and, and produce a response, uh, a correct response. And then executive functioning, and this is um, this idea of cognitive control, so the ability to um, uh, um, both focus and, and be able to execute a task uh, uh, efficiently. And, and so in all these cases, there's, there's both a, a speed component and a function component uh, or, or uh, ability to kind of mentally process information that both seem to be affected by marijuana use. Um, what we have found, and, and this is I think important and we'll come back to this at the end, um, is that individuals who use marijuana and alcohol show even uh, more um, uh, severe decreases in these uh, domains. And so I think that's important because it was, as we look at the uh, just the way marijuana is used broadly 
In many cases, kids are using both marijuana and alcohol. It's not just marijuana. And so uh, when we come back to this at the end, when we're trying to talk about things that we can inform uh, adolescents and young adults about, I think we'll want to talk about the interaction uh, or potential interaction of marijuana with other substances as well. And almost all the data so far show that both using both marijuana and alcohol uh, tend to lead to more severe uh, consequences in the brain. And we can go on to slide 15. So one of the other interesting uh, results that we have found um, is that uh, for brain function, there tends to be what we call compensatory brain responses in individuals who use marijuana. Uh, so um, what we mean by this is that uh, people who use marijuana, for example, may be able to uh, complete a task in a similar way to our controls, our people who don't use marijuana. And so at the behavioral level, maybe uh, for some of these tasks, they perform the same. So they're able to get the same number of correct responses. They're able to process things as quickly. But when we look at it with the fMRI, when we look at what's going on in their brain, it appears that they have to recruit other brain regions that aren't typically associated with accomplishing that task uh, in order to, do, to accomplish the task efficiently. And so what we hypothesize about this is that this might reflect a less efficient processing. So people um, who use marijuana might have to recruit more brain resources to accomplish the same task that someone uh, that one of our controls uh, is able to accomplish with fewer uh, neural resources. And so we, we are exploring that hypothesis because it's a uh, it's something that we're still trying to flesh out a little bit, but that, that seems to be what's happening because there are areas of the brain that uh, typically wouldn't be required to complete some of these tasks. For example, a verbal, uh, verbal memory task uh, or a um, spatial reasoning task. And this is where uh, we might ask people to remember uh, where a certain picture uh, uh, occurs um, and to respond when it occurs in the same position again in their visual field. And it would, what we have found so far is that marijuana users are able to reply and respond at about the same level, again, as controls, but their brains seem to be uh, perhaps working harder in order to do so. All right, and so we can go on, and I just want to sort of summarize um, some of our findings here um, by focusing on uh, a couple of the, the key concepts, and these are the things that I, I really want people to be able to take away from the presentation. Um, the, one, the first thing is that onset is really important. And we've found uh, both in our lab and across many labs that earlier onset of marijuana use leads to increased problems, as, uh, and not only problems in uh, uh, behavioral problems or problems with school or legal problems or dependence problems, but um, these brain and neurocognitive consequences that we found. So individuals who start using marijuana before age 15 or 16 are, have a higher probability of experiencing negative consequences, uh, again, both in behavior and in um, neurocognitive functioning. Uh, dose, again, is going to be really important. So higher potency, uh, particularly of THC, leads to higher effects. Um, and so we're not just talking about um, Acutely, so of course, more THC leads to uh, uh, stronger uh, feelings of being high and, and um, stronger impairment when marijuana is used. But the lasting effects, the neurocognitive consequences, tend to be greater with higher potency. And so, as, if you think back to that chart that I showed, where the, the average potency of marijuana over the last uh, two decades has nearly tripled, um, or or seeing kids being exposed to greater amounts um, of THC uh, over time. And so one of the things that we're going to continue to look at is how the uh, potency changes might affect brain development differently. And then the third is uh, duration. So as, again, as I want you all to think about uh, what you can take away from this, that duration of use or more protracted, longer use can lead to more problems. And so uh, this, this seems uh, 
somewhat self-evident if we think about it, but people who use uh, higher doses over longer periods of time are at greater risk for uh, negative consequences. And again, these are both um, behavioral consequences, uh, so uh, uh, school legal work problems, as well as neurocognitive consequences, so increased uh, uh, neurocognitive consequences. And there are still a number of things. So we've done a lot of research on looking at uh, how marijuana use is associated with different neurocognitive uh, factors. And one of the things about our research um, that's unique here at UCSD is that we're really uh, attempting to take a longitudinal approach. And so what that means is that we're, we're, we recruit kids and we look at them over time. So many of the studies over the last several decades have, have been what we call cross-sectional. And so that's where they'll recruit um, a set of 14-year-olds, a set of 16-year-olds, a set of 18-year-olds, and then compare them just at one point in time. And so what we're really interested in is how individuals develop over uh, time and how uh, different substances might affect that development. And so in order to really do that effectively, uh, we have to look at, um, at longitudinal data. And so some of the remaining questions we have, and so this is slide 17, uh, is uh, how early uh, is, is, uh, is risk increased? And so, as I mentioned so far, most of the data shows that people who begin smoking uh, before age 15 or 16 tend to uh, have increased consequences and show stronger effects. Uh, but, but that's mainly based on cross-sectional data, so looking at um, uh, retrospective reports, so maybe looking at people who are in their 20s and asking them when they started smoking. Um, so we don't really have a great idea of, of how brain development changes over time. We just know that as people say, oh, I started at age 15, um, they, they seem to have stronger consequences at age 23 or 25. Um, but again, we, we don't know what that looks like. And so we're in the process of trying to, to look at how early onset uh, might affect these trajectories. Um, and then also uh, a part of this um, is being able to pull out pre-existing factors. And so these are things that might put you at risk for greater harm. Uh, and so there are a number of uh, findings so far. Some of them are genetics. So there are some genetic factors that tend to put people at greater risk uh, for, for marijuana use uh, or for marijuana uh, or damage from marijuana use, uh, as well as some other risk factors that tend to put people at risk for um, more generally just all substance use problems, so alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. And so being able to, to pull apart and characterize some of those pre-existing factors from the actual consequences of marijuana use is another important um, focus of our research currently. As it relates, uh, and we'll go on to page, uh, slide 18, um, as it relates to dose, um, we're really, uh, as researchers, we're not that great at quantifying dose of marijuana right now. So thinking back to those slides where I depicted uh, THC levels increasing over time, um, as we think about doses, if, if the level of THC that somebody's exposing, them to, exposing themselves to every time they smoke is now triple what it used to be, in, in effect, that, that should be counted as a triple dose. But what, the way we often characterize marijuana is numbers of times of use. Uh, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about researchers in general. Um, but here at UCSD, what we've been working toward is to develop some more precise uh, ways of, a, of quantifying doses and, and to characterize what our uh, adolescents and young adults um, are currently using. And so this requires um, not just knowing a little bit more about the potency of the marijuana, but also their method of administration. Uh, so as many of you uh, who are out in the community, I'm sure, have encountered, uh, more and more people aren't just smoking joints or, or uh, blunts or, or bongs, but there's all sorts of uh, new and different ways of uh, uh, different preparations, whether it's hash oil, uh, 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 hash, edibles, etc. There are all sorts of ways that people are consuming marijuana now, and this has a, a pretty profound effect on the dose that they might be getting at any one time. Uh, and in addition, I, I referred to this briefly, but looking at the THC content versus other cannabinoids, and so I mentioned specifically cannabidiol, um, 
which does uh, at least early reports seem to show that there might be some beneficial effects from it. Uh, but but uh, currently, what our biggest concern is um, is that ratio of THC to cannabidiol currently uh, continues to go up. And so, uh, looking at the potential um, negative consequences of having such a high level of THC relative to other cannabinoids is going to be important uh, because uh, THC, while it is the primary psychoactive substance, is one of, again, uh, over 70 substances that uh, are present in marijuana as when people are consuming it. So uh, it's, it's very important for us to kind of be able to, to think about the effects of THC versus other uh, uh, compounds that are in marijuana. And then as it relates to duration, and this is slide 19, um, we're also interested in, in whether there is recovery or function with abstinence. So uh, as I mentioned, we're interested in trajectories or how the brain changes over time um, and how marijuana use may, may change those trajectories. But it's, we, we're not taking a completely pessimistic look at this, and that is if people are using marijuana as adolescents that their brains are going to be forever destroyed. Uh, but what we do want to be able to characterize is how, um, the, how brains recover with abstinence. So if people do stop, what should they expect um, to uh, to change in their functioning. And in the, in the early studies that we, we have um, been able to look at abstinence, we've shown that even with um, short-term abstinence, and that's uh, four to six weeks, some neurocognitive uh, uh, processes um, improve over time. And uh, in the study of adults, um, it, uh, done by another lab, not ours here, but it showed that um, the brain uh, sensitivity to THC decreases rather rapidly over time. And so what that means is it gives us some, some hope that some of these uh, effects may be uh, reversible. Um, and, and again, we want to be able to characterize those that might be reversible versus those that might be more long-lasting. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that um, as we're trying to educate kids that, that currently we don't know. And so if they hear from uh, certain outlets that, oh no, your brain completely recovers, well, we we currently don't know that that's, that's true. And we're not sure entirely uh, which functions and which areas of the brain may show the longer lasting effects uh, versus other areas that may recover. Um, and so that's part of our, our ongoing research here as well. And then lastly, as for duration, these thresholds of risk. And so uh, by this, I mean, um, can we characterize using over a certain number of times or a certain number of doses or over a certain number of years increases risk a certain percent. And right now we're working out some of these uh, data to, to kind of describe how uh, we know that starting earlier uh, leads to more consequences, but we don't know whether uh, you know, using more than 50 times in your life may it, uh, increase the percentage of risk that you experience. We have a general idea that more is worse, um, but we really don't have a great uh, uh, characterization of what those thresholds might be, particularly in adolescents who are developing. Right, and so I just want to take a minute to describe some of our ongoing research um, because I think we're getting closer to some of the answers on some of these things and we'll have a lot of data that will really be informative as we go forward. Um, there are two ongoing studies that are uh, occurring here at uh, UC San Diego, as well as across the country. So both of these, and this is slide 20, um, both of these studies are, are national consortium studies. And so the first one is the National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Adolescents, or in CANDA. And I put their websites up here, so you're, uh, I encourage you to visit them and look at them a little bit. But so this is a, a study that's uh, while it's focused on alcohol, we're assessing alcohol and all other drug use. Uh, in a sample um, of kids who were recruited originally between ages 12 and 21, uh, but we're following them for, um, we've been following them for three years currently, and we're, we're proposing to be able to follow them for 10 years. And so we'll get a, a, a sample of kids who we can look at prior to the onset of, of alcohol and marijuana use, and we're assessing them annually with neurocognitive tasks and brain scans, so we'll be able to show over time and see what, uh, how their brains change with the onset and offset of marijuana and other substances. 
And so this has a sample of about 830 kids, and it's being run at five sites across the country. Uh, here at UC San Diego, um, at Duke University, at University of Pittsburgh, um, at Stanford University, uh, and at Oregon Health Sciences University. Um, and then the second study is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. And this is a, a study that is um, unprecedented in uh, adolescent development research. So this is a consortium of close to 20 sites across the country, and they're planning to recruit close to 10,000 kids. Uh, and they're recruiting young kids uh, ages 8 to 10, and then they're going to follow them for 10 years. And so this study really will provide the most sensi uh, sensitive data that we have so far for how adolescent development is affected by, by the onset and offset of different substances, so marijuana being a primary focus of this study. And so this study is actually just getting off the ground this year, and so over the next 10 years we'll be collecting data. So I think that's where I'm going to end. I just wanted to draw the, your attention to those because as, as I put these questions up, these, the data that will come out of these studies will really be uh, informative for how we can answer these questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for all of that. Um, and for those of us, for those of the, in the audience that were listening, um, I apologize for some of the uh, technical audio and visual issues. I've, I got a couple of emails. Uh, don't worry about anything that you may have missed. Um, the PowerPoint slides will all be emailed out to you. And so, um, you know, the video that I wasn't able to show is really, really cool um, to put that in a scientific term. <laughs> it's a great video. Um, some of the other images uh, there are, are definitely worth your time. And so they will be there for you. Um, don't worry. If you don't get it for any means, um, please email me again, rbush, B-R-B-U-S-C-H at cadca.org. We've got a, a little over 10 minutes left. Um, and I have a couple of questions here that I want to pose to Dr. Um, Brumbach and then go through a couple of your questions. And then the rest, feel free to email to me and we'll get those taken care of for you. Um, the first question I have for you, uh, Dr. Brumbach, is based on your research that you've done and the conversation that we've had um, so far up to this point, what do you think substance abuse co coalitions, organizations, what's the best thing they can do to apply the research things that you found? Yeah, so I, and I, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I, I come back to uh, education, and, and I know that's a key um, uh, piece of a lot of these community organizations to begin with, but, but recognizing uh, that our kids are, are operating under this assumed knowledge that, well, if it's being legalized, marijuana is not that bad, uh, and, and, you know, like the, the um, picture of the United States map where I was depicting 12 to 17-year-old uh, adolescents, the states where it's legalized, the states where, um, where uh, the risk is perceived as less uh, than other states show higher rates of adolescent use. And so these things go hand in hand. And, and um, you know, a, appealing to this assumed knowledge that, oh, marijuana must not be that bad, uh, it can be really harmful for our kids. And so I think uh, presenting some data and being able to say, look, you know, here's what we do know and here's what we don't know um, could be a, 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 an effective strategy. Um, one of the things that, and I think we find this here even in our, um, in, in some of our studies where we've tried to look at interventions, is that a lot of the, um, the effects might be longer term. Uh, so that is, the, the, uh, it's hard to just tell a 16-year-old kid, well, you don't want to mess up your brain when you're 26, you know, you, you won't be as, uh, you won't have as efficient neural connections, uh, that might not be so effective. So, I mean, I think uh, getting them to look at the fact that we've been able to see uh, improvements over four to six weeks even, so even if they don't perceive that they are uh, having any um, cognitive effects, uh, I mean, the data can, can potentially show otherwise. Um, and then also just kind of uh, educating them on 
how they can be uh, or how they can be knowledgeable consumers. So a lot of kids are putting a lot of things in their bodies that they don't know anything about. Um, and so uh, I know um, it, it can be difficult to, to kind of tread that line between uh, not advocating but encouraging kids to, to educate themselves before they would make such a decision to put something in their body. Uh, because, you know, like I showed, the, the potency of marijuana has gone up so much. Uh, kids may, may uh, be blindsided. Maybe they get a highly potent strain and they don't know, uh, and suddenly, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're having much more severe acute effects um, and, you know, putting themselves in danger in that way as well. And then for, for questions two and three here, um, you know, kind of combine it almost a two A and two B, uh, in a, in if you will. Um, which of your findings do you think are the most important right now for both youth and also either their parents or mentors to recognize? There's a lot of information here. An article itself is um, pretty pretty thorough, pretty dense with information. Um, what are some some takeaways that you want them to really recognize that they can they can speak to? Sure. Yeah, so um, I think one of the keys, and I'll start with parents because uh, I think it's a little uh, easier in that, in that way, but is to recognize that earlier onset is uh, is one of the, the greatest risks. And so, um, you know, we when we're interviewing kids who are 12 and 13 and 14 who have already started using marijuana, uh, Often the case is uh, either their parents use, uh, and so they are around it, whether their parents are advocating their own use, the, the point is that it's, it's um, sort of acceptable in their, their parents or in their household, um, and that uh, frankly is putting their kids at much greater risk. And so as, this, as the push for uh, legalization uh, or decriminalization goes on, uh, there is this perception in families that that, oh, well, if my parents don't think it's that bad, then maybe it's not that bad. And so I think even even parents who uh, may use themselves or may feel like it's not that bad uh, should, should really recognize that young kids um, are at much greater risk uh, than adults, uh, and, and especially, um, you know, below age 15 and 16. Um, so for youth, again, I go back to what I had mentioned before, but really, uh, being educated about what is in marijuana and, and um, thinking about the potential consequences that aren't just about the, the high that they might be after. And so this is one of those difficult uh, points, again, to get across when, when kids are all uh, really focused on the short term, on the high that they might get on uh, you know, fitting in with their friends as being part of the group, um, but that especially for, for uh, teens and adolescents, uh, the decision to use uh, can lead to long-term consequences. Um, and the other part of that is, is that marijuana is not innocuous from a treatment standpoint either, and that one in 11 people who use marijuana end up with marijuana dependence. Um, and so, you know, lots of kids think, well, marijuana is not addictive. Uh, and that's something that we often hear with, with our adolescents and teens, and, and that's, uh, that's not true, um, that there, there is a marijuana dependence, and it's the second leading cause of treatment uh, seeking for, for substance dependence. So um, those facts that really just need to be um, eradicated uh, because the, the people uh, uh, don't think that they're true or they think that marijuana is not addictive, uh, those are things that, that um, with some simple education, I think we can change some of the perception. Great. Well, I want to get to some of the questions uh, for that, that have been submitted. Um, we only got a few minutes here. I'll try and get to as many as we can in the next uh, five minutes or so. Uh, one person asked, um, going back to some of the uh, compensatory tasks that the testing that was done with some of the people, sometimes the patients were able to complete the tasks, but the brain had to maybe work harder to do that. What's negative about the brain having to work harder to complete the same tasks as other people? Yeah, that's a good question. And so, um, so what is negative about it uh, may be a little bit unclear to us currently, and, and that is 
if they're able to get to the same uh, behavioral effect but uh, have to work harder, maybe that may, the, the thought might be, well, maybe that means it's okay. Um, but what we have found, and this is again as an adolescent and young adult, that those compensatory responses in these adolescents and young adults tend to uh, go away over time, and, and how should I say this? So they, they tend to diminish over time, I should say. So in later adults who are uh, continuing marijuana users, uh, they show behavioral effects and their brains seem to not be able to compensate enough. Uh, to be able to achieve the task the same way. And so I think part of this is uh, thinking about how marijuana use uh, may uh, alter normal development or, or um, typical development. Uh, so, you know, again, we have early evidence that those compensatory responses only work for so long. So in adults, they're not able to kind of keep up um, in, in later adulthood. Uh, uh, but, but there may be some unforeseen consequences that we're not entirely uh, clear on yet. But it, that's a good question. Uh, next one we have here, uh, rapid fire for you. <laughs> do, do the vast differences in strains of marijuana make it difficult to come to any general conclusions about their effects? Uh, so, um, in some ways, yes, and we would like to be better at it. Um, but what we, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, what we do is look at kind of the, the average consumption. And so um, certainly we could be more precise if we're able to look at specific uh, THC content. For, um, uh, but, you know, I, I think about um, some of the popular um, uh, press recently, and, and uh, for anyone out there who is a, a UFC fan, I just saw recently, I'm, I don't follow it a lot, but it was in the news because apparently a UFC fighter after his fight uh, was using a vape pen with uh, cannabidiol, that CBD that I mentioned, and, and promoting it as a, uh, it, would, it would help his brain heal. And um, I, I think, you know, messages like that, people just hear that it's, a, it's a, an extract from marijuana and they think, well, look, you know, this guy's promoting it as, as healing his brain after he got punched in the face a lot. Uh, you know, maybe THC or, you know, maybe marijuana would help me. Um, and the, the fact is there, there's just a lot of um, variation in, uh, in what, we, what we know about particular strains. Um, but overall and in general, the level of THC increasing so much has, has led to increased uh, both functional and structural consequences on brain development. And so, well, again, we'd like to be a lot more precise than we can be currently. Uh, we have seen over time in the last decade with that THC uh, potency increasing, we're seeing more uh, dramatic effects earlier. So. And, and the last question that, that we'll take right now, um, you just mentioned CBD. One person wrote, it has come to our attention that in many states, CBD in and of itself is not illegal or written into the controlled substances laws. If this is the case, then why are some states passing legislation to legalize it for medical purposes if it's not illegal in the first place? Can you help us understand a little bit more about this question about CBD? Sure, yeah, and so, and I, I don't know the, the legal status in many states. Um, but uh, insofar as CBD can be extracted from marijuana, uh, it could be um, potentially distributed in a legal way in many states. Um, of course, that requires a lab or uh, some, uh, some entity to be able to extract it from marijuana. And so that, I think that's where it gets a little bit difficult. Um, and in some, in, uh, some states, uh, they classify marijuana itself um, for the legal or, or uh, illegal status. And so understanding that, that this is an extract um, from marijuana uh, is, is part of that. Um, and really, uh, while there may be, uh, I, would, I guess I would call them legal loopholes, um, if it can be sold as, as a standalone product, I think the, the bigger issue is in the, in the development and in the um, production of CBD 
Um, and, and again, this, you know, I, I don't mean to be completely um, dismissive of any uh, research on CBD because there has been some evidence that it seems that it might be uh, might have some neuroprotective effects. However, again, the the, uh, the governance and the the uh, uh, kind of oversight of CBD as a product has really been lax. So it's not something that currently there's a there's a oversight by the, the FDA and things that um, allows for it to be distributed in a medical way um, uh, effectively. So I hope that's helpful, but uh, there's a lot more research that could go uh, into that as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I really do wish we could keep going. Unfortunately, uh, we have, we're out of time and and uh, I know that everyone has things that they have to get off to today, but I just can't thank you enough, Dr. Rumbach. Um, I'm getting so many messages here in my inbox right now from people um, saying how thankful they are to have this information, and, and particularly with some with scientific backing and and research. It there's just such a big argument out there, and it's nice to have um, real substantive. A uh, foundation um, to what you're saying in getting out this message to youth um, and their development. So, thank you very, very much um, for taking uh, your time, not just with us th today, but also and you and your colleagues and all the hours that you've spent um, putting this together. Um, and thank you to those who joined us in the audience. Again, um, I will be sending out the powerpoints. If you have any questions, if you don't get the powerpoints. Um, I'm always available uh, at rbush, R-B-U-S-C-H, at cadca.org. Um, Dr. Brunbach, uh, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me, and thank you, everyone, for, for listening and for the questions. All right. Bye-bye.